Hello and welcome back to my channel. Oh my gosh, I did not think I would be able to make this video before the end of the year, quite honestly, but I'm so thrilled that I am. Um, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Fair enough, fair enough. I've just been keeping this little secret to myself for quite a while. However, if you follow me on social media and you're on my email list, then you already kind of know this, but I wanted to make a video about my experience passing the Canadian Securities course, because honestly, when I was studying for the CSE, I was watching every single video I could find on YouTube, and there's not that many about how to pass the CSC. I am one of those people that I get very anxious before exams. I just have like zero confidence in myself. I don't know why, but that is something I'm working on. And so I was trying to like see, okay, what did other people do? What were their study tips? You know, what were their experiences like? And so I thought, okay, if I pass this exam, I'm gonna make a video because hopefully this will be helpful for anyone who is also studying for the CSC or hoping to pass or thinking of signing up to it. So let's do it. Let's talk about the Canadian securities course. What's my experience like? What are some tips that I have for you and uh, why the hell you should think about taking it. So let me kind of give you uh, some context and background uh, of what my experience was. So I started studying uh, at the end of July and I took the first exam, volume one, this little guy, fun, uh, in mid-September and then I took the second exam in mid-October. Now, the reason I did it in basically three months wasn't because I'm just like awesome and super smart and just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna kill this in record time. And no, it's because I'm the worst procrastinator in the world. I actually signed up for the CSE two years ago and I let uh, it basically lapse for a year, renewed it, you can renew your li license for a following year. So I paid some money to do that because I was, uh, my excuse was I was busy, but really I think I was like terrified of cracking up open those books because I literally did not crack open those books that first year. And then the second year I kind of looked through them and I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe I'll set some time. And then again, got busy and then, you know, 2020 happens and then the pandemic happens and my license was supposed to expire this July actually. And then um, everything got put on hold because no one can take exams because they're still doing exams in person. Yes, you have to do this exam in person. Um, and so they actually gave me an extension till the end of October. And so for me, I'm like, listen, this does not happen every single day and we do not want this to expire and then you have to pay another $1,500 for this course. That would just make you feel so stupid. So uh, maybe you should get your act together and study and try to pass this uh, exam before your license expires. And that is what I did and somehow it worked out. I don't know. So the first kind of tip I would say, give yourself plenty of time to study. Three months, in my opinion, is is not enough time. Like I was able to go through, like I read both textbooks twice, yes, twice, and made a crazy amount of note cards, which I will show you. Here we go. Note cards. These are the note cards I took. That, look at this. Oh my God, is this the same size as my head? It's almost the size of my head. That is not okay. That is not Okay, anyways, so I took it in three months because I basically gave myself an impossible deadline and somehow I survived it. In my opinion, a better time frame would be six months, maybe nine months. 12 months, I kind of feel like is too long. You're gonna, you're just gonna get lazy and you're gonna do <laughs> what I did, which is procrastinate until the last minute. So give yourself a good amount of time, but not too much time that you will procrastinate. So in terms of what did, what was my study plan exactly? Um, okay, so this is another thing that I would suggest that you do. It, <laughs> do not, don't follow what I did. Um, so I read the first textbook in about two weeks, um, read the second textbook volume two in two weeks, and then went back to volume one and studied until I had to take the exam and then went back to volume two and did uh, that exam. So um, the reason I wouldn't do that is um, you really should just focus on one volume at a time. There is so much information and quite honestly, I found volume one more difficult than volume two. Um, it, when you're trying to absorb two textbooks, um, at the same time, it just gets kind of overwhelming and you're gonna miss something. So my opinion, focus on volume one, take the exam, then start studying for volume two. <laughs> Don't do what I did. 
I just, I, I don't know why I did it. I, it just wasn't a good plan, but here we are. We passed, it's fine, everything's fine. Another suggestion, this is something that I did do right, was don't cheap out. If you're gonna cheap out on something in life, maybe not on an exam that you hope to pass to help your career, just a thought. So I opted for the most expensive package because there's a couple of different packages you can sign up for. So I got the uh, Canadian Securities Course Value Pack Combo, which is, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But the reason I wanted that is because, um, you, well, you get the textbooks first off, but you also uh, get practice exams for uh, both volumes. And also, which I found like the, the most important part was you get a bunch of videos. Now they're not glamorous videos. They're not, <laughs> they're not super exciting. It's really just a voiceover and a whiteboard. But I found them super helpful because I'm someone who is very visual when it comes to learning. So I love reading, but sometimes there are certain concepts where I just, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't get in there. It just wouldn't stick in there. And then I'd watch some of the videos and I'd be like, oh my God, oh, I get it now. So I wanna talk about, because I feel like this is something that I kept on trying to find the answer to, what sections should I really focus on? Like what are kind of the things that I really should spend my time memorizing and studying? So for volume one, it was very clear fixed income. So, and I hate, I. I hated those sections. I hate fixed income so much. And I didn't think it, I had no problem with it before volume one, but yeah, it really sucked. I didn't enjoy it. So it's really um, in volume one, chapter six and seven, fixed income securities, features and types and fixed income securities, pricing and trading. You will not only have to understand the concepts, but you'll need to know the formulas. And yes, you have to memorize those formulas because um, you will be presented with questions being like, what is the answer to this? And you'll have to do the math, which I hate. Like as someone who works in personal finance, I actually hate math. I just don't enjoy it. It doesn't make me happy, but you gotta do what you gotta do to get this uh, certificate. So you're gonna have to really focus on those sections. Also, I found um, like chapters one, two, and three, the Canadian marketplace, super easy. Uh, the economy, I enjoyed it. I do have still a problem to this day. To, I get some things mixed up when it comes to that. Um, those were really important, but it's only, it says about 13% in terms of weighting. And also if you're wondering, you can find out the weightings um, for sections. They're all approximate, so they're not, you know, um, to the T to what the exam is gonna look like, but it does give you a, a really good feel for what should you really focus on. Um, but so basically it really is like the Canadian marketplace is I'd say like the second bit to really focus on and then fixed income. Fixed income takes up about like 23%. When it came to the exam, I felt like it took like 30 to 35% of the exam. Now for volume two, and I think I kind of mentioned this, I found volume one more difficult than volume two. It could have been for a few different reasons. First, it was like my first uh, kind of introduction to the textbooks and just the, the practice exams and the real exams. It was all kind of new. And so I think that's why it was, I found it a little bit more difficult. Volume two, I had a better sense of what to expect. So I found it a little bit easier. And also, but quite honestly, I found the content a lot easier to digest. And also I was more familiar with um, all the information because really it focuses on like portfolio analysis, mutual funds, ETFs, managed and structured products, Canadian taxation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, I enjoyed volume two a lot more. I think that's kind of the consensus. I've seen a lot of people talk about that online. So uh, just get through volume one. You're gonna enjoy volume two a lot, lot more. Um, in terms of what you should focus on, well, definitely, yeah. So that's kind of actually what the weightings say. Investment analysis, those, those are chapters 13 and 14 and portfolio analysis 15 and 16. Uh, those are the big, big ones. For me, portfolio analysis, that was a breeze. Investment analysis, like, I, I enjoyed it. It just wasn't, I don't think I was good at it. I just don't think I was very good at that kind of stuff. So those are the kind of two big sections to really, really hone in on and get good at. Now I've actually been getting some questions about what is it like to take an exam during COVID? So it was a bit annoying. I felt like that they don't, the CSI does not offer any exams um, online or like for instance, when I did my financial counselor training, the exams were you would do them at home, you'd log into the portal and then they would have a proctor um, through this company called ProctorU that would watch you take the exam for the entire time. 
time. So it was still kind of like the same format as an exam where it's like, you can only do here. You can't really, you can't get up and, and go to the bathroom or anything like that. You have to dedicate your, you know, several hours to do the exam and someone's watching you. Um, I kind of wish they had that set up for these exams. They do not. You have to go to an exam center, which is kind of freaky. Um, but personally, I felt pretty safe the whole time, as safe as you can be in this weird world that we are in. Everyone has to wear a mask the whole time through the, throughout the exam, getting there, leaving. Um, everyone is socially distanced. You're in a, I mean, at least the center that I was in, you're in your own cubicle with walls. So you feel pretty protected. Um, you also, they take your temperature, um, all that kind of stuff. Some things that I didn't know before the first exam, which are helpful is, um, you have to get there, I believe 30 minutes early, but during that time when you're just waiting in the exam center, you're actually allowed to bring your textbook and bring your, you know, the notes and you can go through them. So you actually have a little bit of extra study time. I did not know that the first exam and so I, I brought a few notes but not all of them I'm like oh, I probably could have gotten a little bit more studying done but um, I did that for the second exam did it really help me not not really. Another thing too is, so you can do the computer-based exams or the uh, paper-based exams. Paper-based is obviously free. That's kind of the benefit. Uh, so you don't have to pay any money. If you want to do the computer-based exams, it's $75. I did the computer-based because the biggest uh, thing for me was you get your, um, basically whether you passed or failed immediately after you hit the submit button, which I wanted to know because I really need to know if I pass volume one, that I can move on to the volume two exam. I need to know if I pass or failed immediately. With the paper-based exams, I think you have to wait two weeks or something like that. So, and maybe it's even longer because of COVID. So I would just say, just pay the $75 and do the computer-based ones. And also personally, I found it nice. Just like I liked the layout on the computer. Basically you can scroll through all the questions. Oh, another, I I'll get to some tips actually, cause they're just actually coming into my mind, but I found the layout online very easy. I think I haven't done a paper-based exam in so long. I, I think I'd find it actually a little bit harder than a computer exam. So, okay. So some tips that, um, may be helpful. Um, so in terms of like actually taking the exam, this is, something that really helped me. Um, first, and you also do, they do give you some uh, paper. Um, if you're doing the paper-based exam, you do have to bring um, a uh, pencil and an eraser, but you can actually use a pen if you're doing the computer-based, but you can't use a pen if you're doing the paper-based. Um, so I just brought a pen, but they do give you a few sheets of paper to write notes and you know calculations and whatever you want on there. Obviously you, can, you also have to bring a calculator. Um, so I think I didn't mention this, but I did mention this in the blog post that I wrote about it. So I'll link to that in the description. Um, so if you do like the buy the value pack, they give you a calculator and I think I actually have it. It's just this like sharp financial calculator. I hate it. I don't like it, especially when you're online or on YouTube and you're nerding out and looking at, you know, you know, calculator, uh, tutorials, <laughs> nothing. I didn't find anything with this particular calculator. So I did spring for the Texas instruments one, which I'm so glad I did. Do I have it here? Okay. So I have no idea where my Texas instruments, uh, calculator is. I'll pop a picture of what it looks like. Now that's going to bug me for the rest of this video that I don't know where that calculator is because I need it because I have more exams to take. Anyways, highly recommend don't use this free calculator they give you. It's kind of a piece of crap. Um, just spring for the Texas Instruments one because uh, also in the videos that um, you get access to in the value pack, he shows you a bunch of tutorials on how to use it for some bond calculations and he uses the Texas Instruments ones, not this. So yeah, just pay the money, get the better calculator. Oh yeah. So what I wanted to share was when you are doing the exam, one thing I found very helpful was when you, um, basically are presented with the exam. I think sometimes we, we automatically think that we should start at the beginning. I don't like doing that. Basically when you're studying, you know, the sections that you're good at, right? So what is helpful is the exam is, uh, you know, structured in, it goes from, you know, chapter one all the way to 12. So it is linear, which is very helpful. So you can easily go through all the questions and figure out what sections are where, and then just answer what you know, and then spend the rest of the exam trying to figure out the answers for all the things that you know, you're not as strong at. So that is what I did. And typically, usually I work from the back forward. Um, and also during the computer exam, there's a way where you can 
select an answer, but it's you don't submit. It's not your like final answer. It's kind of like pending or like maybe. And then you can kind of spend some time at the end and actually really go through all your maybes to be like, mm, do I really want to say yes, this is it? Or should I choose a different answer? So uh, definitely do that. Another thing I found helpful, especially when you have the scrap paper is when you do have a question and there's a couple, you're like, you know, you get kind of not focused when you're in the exam because you think of all the different things that you need to know and it gets, it's very, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in the room. Um, what I found very helpful was taking the scrap paper, looking at the question, writing on the paper, A, B, C, D, so all the different um, uh, answers, potential answers, and then going through every one of those answers and crossing off definitely not, definitely not. There's usually two definitely nots. And then usually you have like, well, the answer could be uh, B or D. And then really just focusing on the language of those two. And that kind of helps you because I feel like sometimes we know the answer is between only, uh, you know, this one and this one, but we get really distracted by those other ones. So I, I just find that like, it's a very easy thing. Just cross out the ones that are definitely no's and then just really focus on those two potential answers. And then really remember that you're choosing the best answer. And sometimes that means rereading the question. Um, sometimes I, especially in the practice exams, I saw this and I was able to find out what I did wrong. I would answer a, a question wrong that I actually did know the right answer to because I didn't really read the question how it meant the question to be, if that makes sense. So take your time. And also too, you have two hours, take the full two hours for the first exam. I definitely took the full two hours. I was getting some looks from the proctor being like, why are you You've got like 10 minutes left? I'm like, I'm taking my time. But for volume two, um, I felt a little bit more comfortable. So I only took an hour and a half. Um, but in terms of my grade, I did like, lit I literally got one percentage point higher in the second exam compared to the first exam. So. I don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. Passed and that is what matters in the end. So you may be wondering, why did you take the Canadian Securities course? Are you going to become an investment advisor? I got a lot of questions like that um, on Twitter and Instagram. And my answer is hell to the no. I will never become an investment advisor. I will never work for a financial institution and sell investment or financial products. Not my jam. I like to talk about money. I like to create content about it. I don't like, I don't want to sell you mutual funds. Like that's just not, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. So you may be wondering then why did you take it? Because that is pretty much the course that most people do if you do the CSC, typically it is in order to become a mutual friend rep or an investment advisor. And, and that's fine. I'm not bashing that. It's just not for me. Uh, it's not my path. I mean, I mean, it really isn't my path. I kind of uh, walked into this world of personal finance, not because, oh, I want to work in financial services. I, I did this. I started as a hobby blogger and now I'm just a content creator somehow. Um, so for me, I really just uh, signed up for it because I want to, you know, just gain more knowledge, but also pretty much every money expert or financial planner or journalist that I know, they have taken the CSC. And it's, it was a little FOMO and kind of like, well, if they did it, maybe I should probably do it. That being said, um, I didn't necessarily have like, okay, well, after the CSC, I'm gonna do more education. I kind of thought once I do that, check that off my list, and then I'm good. And of course, what did I do? Like literally two days after passing the exam, I signed up for financial planning one, and then I kind of declared on social media, I'm gonna study to become a CFP. I don't know why I did that, um, but I put it out there and now I can't take it back and that's, that's what I'm gonna do. And part of it is like, I just wanna continue learning and I actually really like, oddly enough, traditional education when it comes to um, personal finance and financial planning and I just wanna get better at what I do. So that's what I'm doing. But uh, here's a few other things that you may want to look at. So number one, you can become a personal financial planner, a PFP. Um, now it depends on what circles you're in. Um, in general, most average people don't know what the hell a PFP is um, because typically it is a, you know, someone who works in financial services, they're a banker, um, they want to be an investment advisor and have that on top of uh, other, you know, uh, credentials. Um, so you can become a PFP if you work in, you know, banking or anything like that, that might actually help you in your career. So the Canadian securities course, that is a foundational course. I'll kind of show you, um, here a graphic of the, this is the kind of different paths or 
different routes you can take using the CSC as a foundational course to get to the PFP. Another route, especially if you want to get more into that portfolio manager or advising rep or, or, or whatever kind of path, again, you can use the CSC as a foundational course um, for a couple different routes um, to become a chartered investment manager, a CIM. You can also do this thing called the MTI Estate and Trust professional. So this, it's not really a foundational course because it's something that you apparently take at the end. Um, but yeah, if you want to take that designation for your career, um, you will need the CSC. And finally, um, for me, I'm going to try to do the CFP. You can also try to do the QAFP and use this as a foundational course. I was considering doing the QAFP just because it seemed a little bit easier, but then I'm kind of like, Again, the, the reason I kind of want to pursue the CFP is because it is a globally recognized designation. Um, part of the kind of annoying thing of me and my current designation, which is Accredited Financial Counselor Canada, is no one has heard of it <laughs> besides people that already have it or, you know, some people in the financial sphere know about it. It's, it's more popular in the States. It's called the AFC in the States. Um, but yeah, most people don't really know much about the program. It's a great program, um, but yeah, there's not a lot of awareness to it. CFP, everyone knows what the CFP is. So that is kind of why I'm thinking of doing that instead of the QAFP, because no one knows what QAFP is. If you talk to someone and they're like, I'm looking for a financial planner, they'll know CFP. That's, you know, um, a well-known, you know, recognized designation. With that, there are a couple routes you can take. I've decided to take uh, stream number one. So as you can see from this graphic here, there are quite a few courses I have to do. I have got my work cut out for me. I will say though, having d done the CSC, I feel so like more confident and just, I don't know, I, I'm actually really glad I took the CSC. I learned a lot. There's a lot I already knew, but there's a lot of stuff I didn't or I just, you know, needed some more information. Um, so I found it actually very helpful. So to kind of uh, leave you with some final thoughts, one thing I, I did find helpful, as I kind of mentioned, was looking online and, and seeing what other people's experiences were. One thing I didn't find very helpful were people saying, oh, it's easy, you're gonna be fine. And I know lots of people say that because they maybe want to make you feel better about taking the exam, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. It is not an easy course. It says on the website, it will take you between 135 to 200 hours to study for this exam. And I 100% spent 200 or more hours studying. Again, I read both textbooks twice and these were my notes. So I spent my time because I wanted to make sure not only did I pass these exams, but I'm actually absorbing the information because I want to use this information for my job, for the content I create and to eventually move forward uh, and, you know, become a CFP hopefully in a few years because it's going to take me some time to get to that point and actually take the exam. So don't listen to anyone who says it's easy. Don't worry about it. This is not an exam that you can just, you know, breeze through the, you know, textbooks and just be like, Oh yeah, I get it. No, like, no, there are some meaty textbooks and there's just so much content to absorb. And the one thing that another tip too, is I feel like sometimes we'll be reading the textbooks and you'll kind of feel like, Oh, that's probably not important. I don't have to really remember that part. And that part will be on the exam. So it's really important to remember and just really absorb every single thing in these textbooks. So give yourself plenty of time to study, study more than you think you should. You'll never regret studying more. You'll always regret not studying enough. So make sure to keep that in mind. So that is kind of my, my thoughts uh, about the CSC. Hopefully it's been helpful. Um, let me know what you think. If you have any questions about the CSC, let me know. Cause I feel like I feel like it's still very, you know, in my mind because I passed uh, the exams recently. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments. And if you like this video, make sure to like it. And if you wouldn't mind, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, but that is it for me. Thanks so much for watching my video about the Canadian Securities course. Uh, I'll be back uh, very soon with another video. Thanks so much.